Affleck, and I want to thank you for joining me and supporting Paralyzed Veterans of America. I joined the Navy to serve my country as a Navy SEAL. While parachuting with my platoon, my parachute didn't open. I broke my neck. It left me paralyzed. Paralyzed Veterans of America was by my side from that moment on. Since 1946, Paralyzed Veterans of America has kept a promise to our wounded veterans. We will never leave a fallen comrade behind. Thanks to PVA, Paralyzed Veterans are getting specialized medical care and treatments. The benefits they've earned, the jobs they want, and the accessible vehicles and homes they need. I just don't think my family would be as happy as they are without the support that I received from Paralyzed Veterans of America. Our veterans fought for us. Let's fight for them. To learn more, go to pva.org today. Anticipate potential delays for the morning commute. In other news, a recent government report on prescription drug pricing points to corporate mouth. Freedom of the press is about your right to know. What are you talking about, man? Look at this stat. It's about your right to be informed. Your right to access all types of information keeps us free as a nation. No, 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 no. Today, there are real threats to press freedom. Residential areas by... And your right to know about the world around us. Look. Some threats are obvious, some are easy to miss, but they all put our way of life at risk. We must defend against all of these threats, no matter what kind of news is important to you. Justified putting American troops in harm's way. That's a great question. We must protect our right to know before it's too late. Understand the threats. Protectpressfreedom.org. Anticipate potential delays for the morning commute. In other news, a recent government report on prescription drug pricing points to corporate mouth. Freedom of the press is about your right to know. What are you talking about, man? Look at this stat. It's about your right to be informed. Your right to access all types of information keeps us free as a nation. No, 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 no. Today, there are real threats to press freedom. residential areas by... And your right to know about the world around us. Look. Some threats are obvious. Some are easy to miss. But they all put our way of life at risk. We must defend against all of these threats, no matter what kind of news is important to you. Justified putting American troops in harm's way. That's a great question. We must protect our right to know before it's too late. Understand the threats. Protectpressfreedom.org. You've messed up your son's haircut. Mm, Mom? Do you A, try to fix it, like it never happened. B, work with what you got. Or C, show solidarity. Thank you, babe. As a parent, there are no perfect answers. But you don't have to be perfect to be a perfect parent. Thousands of teens in foster care will love you just the same. You've messed up your son's haircut. Mm, Mom? Do you A, try to fix it? Like it never happened. B, work with what you got. Or C, show solidarity. Thank you, babe. As a parent, there are no perfect answers. But you don't have to be perfect to be a perfect parent. Thousands of teens in foster care will love you just the same. Your daughter just had her first breakup. Do you A, put yourself in her shoes? <laughs> B, console her. Don't worry, sweetie. This is gonna happen a lot. Or C, find her a new boyfriend. Nice, single boys. <laughs> that was weird. As a parent, there are no perfect answers. But you don't have to be perfect to be a perfect parent. Thousands of teens in foster care will love you just the same.
welcome to Therapy Ain't No Joke, in which this is the show designed to talk about all things mental health in our community and across the board. Good evening. I am the architect, Sean Garvey. You have me until 9 p.m. Eastern Standard Time on all multiple streaming platforms, including YouTube. Don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel. We have two YouTube channels, by the way. We Break Radio and the Mental Space Live. All right, we are syndicated. We're not just only on YouTube, but we are also on your television screen. We are on Honey, as you can see at the top there of your screen. Honey, make sure you download the Honey app to your Roku TV or your Roku device to watch us live streaming on Roku, honey, that's right, folks. We are experiencing some technical difficulties all day on the Honey app. We are working on some things to give you a better viewing experience uh, by next week. So just bear with us. We appreciate your patience in advance. And we are also syndicated on the Flow Television Network. That means that we're not just only on the flow, but we are also on Apple TV, Fire TV, and Android TV. We are everywhere, ladies and gentlemen. You can check out our past archive shows of Therapy Ain't No Joke on Spotify and on iHeartRadio, iHeart Podcast, and wherever you get your podcast from. Uh, by next week, we will also be on Amazon Fire TV. That's right, ladies and gentlemen. We're going to be on Amazon Fire TV. So we are expanding even more in syndication. I am so happy about that. And uh, we got some great things getting ready to happen on the Honey channel. So I'm so looking forward to that as well. All right. Uh, if you are new to the program, like I said, this is the show in which we talk about all things considered mental health in our community and across the board. All right. Uh, we got a great show for you all tonight, ladies and gentlemen. We have some special guests that are in the uh, green room as we speak. But before I get into that, ladies and gentlemen, I got to remind you all that if you or someone you know is experiencing a mental health crisis or is thinking about taking his or her own life, make sure you dial the 988 number. Have that saved in your phone. You should have that number on speed dial right about now. That is 988. We're going to have that up in our uh, showrunner in just a few moments. Uh, and if you are unable to dial 988, which is real simple, by the way, it's 988. You can also contact the National Alliance for Mental Illness helpline at 1-800-950-NAMI. That's 1-800-950-NAMI or 6264. Once again, that is 1-800-950-6264 or send them an email to info at NAMI.org. Operational hours are from 10 a.m. to 10 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, all right? It is almost 10 minutes after the top of the hour tonight's show is on my mental health journey, All right? Uh, we got a very, very uh, important show. As always, this is our third week of Therapy Ain't No Joke. And um, let me just say this before we go into something that I want to play for you all tonight. Um, we got some amazing episodes in the can uh, and, and some amazing guests that we are going to be bringing on in the next couple of weeks. And let me let you all know how important this show really is. We always talk about mental health in any room, in any space, on any platform. But I want to ask you all this to my listening audience. How important is it to really go seek therapy? How important is it? Because we can talk about mental health all day. We talk about mental health on this show, of course. But it's one thing to talk about. It's one thing to have these podcasts, these shows, these programs, uh, this type of content talking about mental health, therapy, et cetera, et cetera. 
but how many people are actually going out to go seek therapy? Let me see by a show of hands who have already have done the work or are planning to go see a therapist tomorrow. How, how many of you are really taking this therapy thing seriously? Like I said, it's one thing to talk about mental health and talk about the art of therapy. But how many of you are actually going out to seek a therapist? How many of you are? I want you all to answer that question or put it in the comments section. We're also on Instagram at Sean Garvey ATL. You follow me there and on Facebook at Sean Garvey. But how many of you are actually going out to doing the work or talking to a therapist other than just listening to a podcaster or a broadcaster like myself or other online therapists? How many of you are actually doing the work? Okay. So, you know, just, just ponder on that, wonder on that for a moment there. All right. Tonight's show, ladies and gentlemen, my mental health journey. And I came across this one person recently. And, uh, you know, I always love bringing on guests that want to have in-depth conversations about their mental health journey, right? Last week's show, we talked about unhealed dating. We're going to revisit that in just a few moments. Uh, and that's also on demand as well. But I, I come across so many people, you know, within the two going on three years of me doing a mental health based radio program. And I, I hear so much of so many profound stories from mental health advocates and people dealing with some form of trauma, depression, anxiety, you name it. And I, I thought I'd bring this one person onto the show tonight to go more in depth about her mental health journey. Her name is Megan, by the way. Uh, she's an actress, a great one, I must say. And uh, she sent me an audio that I'm going to play for you all. And she's talking about her own experiences of dealing with anxiety, dealing with depression and dealing with heartbreak and even abuse at one point in time. So before we talk to Megan one-on-one -on -one, and we bring in our another guest uh, in just a few moments, I'm gonna play this audio clip. It's only about seven minutes and some change long, but I'm gonna play the audio clip and then we'll dive right into the conversation with Megan. So let's go ahead and pull the uh, clip up so we can go ahead and play it. Because I'm, I'm interested in, in talking to her one on one and in having another person talking to her and just having a dialogue on mental health, why is it important to have these conversations and what she's doing to manage her well being. So let's go ahead and, and play the clip and then we'll get right back into the show. Therapy and no joke with Sean Garvey, almost 15 minutes past the top of the hour. Do we have that clip ready, producer? Okay, we have it ready. Go ahead. Let's play the clip. Thank you. And um, I guess I've always had um, anxiety growing up. Um, I could never make um, eye contact even when I was young. Um, and then when I got older, um, I got so anxious um i went to a private school and i would um people would bully me and i would um just sweat through my uniform and i would get depressed um because my grandma 
was going through some really bad health problems. I remember spending my birthday um, in the hospital with her and just thinking that, like, nobody really cared about me. And then when I was 16, I had a seizure out of nowhere um, on a horse uh, during a family reunion. And um, I went through a really tough time during that. Um, I, I've always acted since I was young, and that's how I got, you know, my feelings out, and, um, I, then my doctor said, well, you know, you probably shouldn't act on stage anymore. It, it would be best if you would do some other job. Um, and I remember that so vividly. And I was like, that's never going to happen. Um, so I was diagnosed with the hat. Um, and then when I went to grad school, um, because I wanted to keep acting, I, I refused to let anything down, even though I went through, at one point, um, I had this like nervous breakdown um, where I was hallucinating and my depression was at an all-time high and I was um, going through abusive boyfriends because I thought if I can't fix myself, I'll fix other people. Um, so, anxiety, depression, toxic, manipulative, abusive boyfriends, and then on medication, and then I went to grad school and I started having, like, my legs would give out. And I started having these spasms. I was extremely on edge. Uh, just, I wasn't eating as I should. Um, I, I wasn't, I was always dehydrated. Um, and so I told my mom about this. And turns out I have an extremely rare disorder. Um, a lot of people have never heard of it. Um, it has to do with your mitochondria. Um, and it has to also do with um, its progressive. So I still, to this day, I try, I have my really good days, and I have my really bad days, and I try to give a voice to those who don't, and I don't know where I'll be in 10 years. I hope I'll still be happy and healthy, but I remember my doctor, my neurologist, 
he told me, he knew nothing about this, but he said that um, I have probably five years to live. And that came from a man who knew nothing about it. And I broke up with my boyfriend because I said that he has a lot much and a lot better to do with his life than be with me. Um, so, um, I'm still in my healing phase. I am not dating. I'm just focusing on loving myself. So, I know that was more than a paragraph, and I apologize. <laughs> but, um, it's been a long journey. So, thank you. <laughs> Welcome back to the Therapy Ain't No Joke show. What you just heard was Megan herself telling her own story, and we have Megan in the studio right now. Good evening, Megan. Welcome to Therapy Ain't No Joke. Hi. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you for coming on board. What <laughs> a compelling story. It's a lot. It's a lot. <laughs> yeah, it's a lot, a lot to take in, but it's something that we need to hear on tonight's show. Wow. Um, I know there's a lot of things that are going through your mind right now, especially hearing your own story in that recording. What, what's going through your mind right now? Right now, um, <laughs> well, first of all, hearing your own voice it's never great but um, um yeah it's it's like wow i have been through a lot in my short life um and you know i i have done the work um i could do more because, you know, I, I heard you talking about doing the work, but I know I could do more. Like, for example, today I spent most of my day in bed because I just didn't want to get out of bed. Um, but, you know, I... Um, I've been doing a lot better, um, like a lot of during this week, I've been meditating. I, um, I've gotten back into acting. I'm in The Miracle Worker. It's a story about Helen Keller. Um, I'm playing Helen Keller. So, um, and it makes me happy. Like, without acting, I don't know what I would do. Do you see acting as some form of therapy to you? Definitely. Definitely. And um, I worked with kids with disabilities. Um, and half the cast had disabilities and half the cast didn't. And I saw how healing it was um, for those who had disabilities because they were playing someone else than who they were, you know? Mm. Um, and it was just so beautiful to watch. Um, so I'm always a huge advocate for acting. <laughs> mm. I, I want to just go back into yeah. the recording to the beginning when you said you was a child and you was experiencing <laughs> these different things or, or what not. And I know 
for me as a kid, even every kid, let me just speak in general for a moment, for every kid, he or she is going to go through their own adversities, their own challenges in life, whatever that looks like. And of course, we didn't know what mental health was. Yeah. We didn't know what mental health was. We didn't know what trauma looked like. Or We know that when things happen to us, we later in life question ourselves. Was it my fault? Why did I, why did I get involved in this situation? Or what's going on with me? We tend to question a lot of things, right? So, you know, in, in your own childhood and experiencing these different things and stuff, like, did you have any type of support system that was in place that you could go run to or talk to about these different things that you were experiencing as a child at the time? Right. I, uh, so I'm an only child and, um, that's always, a double-edged sword because you know you get all of the attention whether it's good or bad and um you know my my dad focused on work he was never really home so it was like mostly my mom it, it, she was pretty much a single mom and she was a workaholic so i also had a lot of trauma during childhood and those are your formative years um i i had some and what i didn't mention in my uh voice memo that I sent you is that um, I had some sexual abuse during my formative years. And I feel like whatever happens during those years can really affect who you are as an adult. So, you know, anxiety, depression that forms who you are um so i yes like i had my aunt i had my mom she was working a lot at the time um but i i didn't really have someone i could always talk to you and go to and so i i think that was a big thing with my mental health mm. and you know as kids um we also had imaginary friends yes. right? as kids that if we didn't have anybody to talk to or to go to for a conversation or guidance or what have you. We have these imaginary friends that we would talk to. And a lot of people back in the day thought that it was something wrong with us. It was something wrong with us talking to ourselves or talking to something or someone that didn't appear to be real to mm -hmm. other people. Yeah, especially if you're on the outside looking in. And and the thing, ladies and gentlemen, that me and Megan have in common is that we're both only children. I never had any siblings, but looking at it now, like my cousins have become my siblings. But with me being an only child and you being an only child, yeah, you're right. We didn't have the outlets or if there were outlets at the time, we didn't have the access to go those outlets to have a sit down and conversation with people to figure out what is actually going on or just to have that safe space to really talk to somebody you know what i mean so it, I, you know those i mean even though there were good moments in my childhood there were moments where 
I look back now and I question it. Yeah, do you still, as an adult now, do you still question, do you find yourself questioning those things that happened in your early childhood? Um, do you mean? Like in some instances and in some situations, just thinking back at it and like, you know, why did this happen or, or do you think if I had did this, this kind of way, or if I had made this decision instead of going to that other path or what have you, my life would have been alternate. It would have been different from where my life is at now. Like, cause I sometimes question my decisions, my choices or certain things that I have come in contact with as a kid. You know what I mean? Like, I sometimes question myself. 100%. Yeah. Yeah. I, and it's funny you say that because I was actually thinking about that earlier today. Um, yeah. And it's, it's something you could ask yourself, you know, shoulda, coulda, woulda mm. all the time. But, you know, uh, I, I just, I, I always think, you know, that, for example, it's like, I, I can't find a job right now. Um, a job or something within the industry um, as an actor. Um, it's really hard. And so I'm like, what if I did went with something in finance or the, I don't know, uh, majored in business? Because that's very stable or maybe a nurse. I, I don't know. They're right. always yeah. <laughs> they're always looking for nurses. Um, yeah. But when I was studying acting, everybody was questioning me. They were like, "So what's your plan B?" And I was like, "Well, I don't need a plan B. I mean, lawyers don't. So why would I?" And I I don't question myself now i i will never question myself because there's a reason i'm down this path but there <laughs> i i still do wonder what if you know mm, the what ifs yeah yeah mm -hmm. there there's always gonna be a what if that's always right. Yeah. Yeah, the what ifs. You know, I mean, sometimes we can't control the inevitable or even at times we can't control certain things that come our way in life. But what we can control is self-control. Right. That is what we can control, self-control. You know, there's people out here that take things out on other people because of their own discretions, their own personal discretions or their bad choices or their form of lack of awareness or mental illness or whatever they're facing, right? Mm -hmm. And I, sometimes, I, I would see something on television, right? Like speaking of entertainment business, cause we were, we we're in the same field. And I would see this person on television, younger than me, that have made it, that are now larger than life, right? They made it and everything. And that just does something to me at 40, I'm 40 years. And it just does something to me like, man, you know, I put in all this work I put in all this effort in my career and everything. I should be where that person is at right now. You know what that does to me mentally, but I have to. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Yes. It's, it's like, it's almost like, what did they do or how, how did they, 
like it's like am, am i not good enough <laughs> Mm. that's that's what's like replaying in my head am i not good enough like what do i need to do or what 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 am i not doing or like i've i've been in atlanta for this amount of time and i've been auditioning and auditioning and yeah i expect no's i expect rejections because it's a part of the the job but what am i doing wrong <laughs> yeah. so it's 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 hard but you know it i keep telling myself I'm like okay i can do it i can do it it's going to happen mm. but <sighs> I, I've come to learn that, you know, there is just, we have no control over anything in life. And my mom has said, we, you know, we just make all of these plans in life. And God is up there laughing at our plans because they just, they don't have, I, I'm not saying this correctly, but God is up there laughing at our plans because he has something in store for us. So I try to keep that in mind. You got to keep that in mind. You got to have a positive mindset in this challenging, uncertain world that we in right now. And it's always good to have a positive mindset, even when you're not where you need to be or you're facing a certain type of circumstance. Because if you always think negative, 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 it's going to always be negative. And it's going to be more fires on top of fires on top of fires. And you're not going to be able to get the extinguisher out to you know, put the fire out, you know, and I think that's just something that we have to keep in mind as mental health advocates or just people that are going through our own mental health journey like you are going through and, and just have a positive mindset. I want to do this, Megan. I want to bring Angela Williams from Angela's Voice on in just a few moments. We're going to take a quick break from the radio and from the TV so that way we can uh, bring Angela onto the studio, into the studio and have a conversation with her. She's going to talk about her own mental health journey and just have a one-on-one -on -one conversation between you and Angela because there's some things there, Angela um, and, and, and Megan, of course, Megan with us. Um, some things there that you want to be able to peel back the layers and be able to express yourself fully on your journey and why therapy is not a joke. It's, it's important to not just only you, but to all of us. So I want to hear more about your story. I'm going to do some revisits, some more revisits in just a few yeah. moments and uh, stick around. Okay. So, hey, Megan, you're going to hang out with us, right? You're going to still hang out with us? And oh, heck yeah. In depth <laughs> conversations, so we'll go more in depth. All right, great. It is therapy, ain't no joke with Sean Garvey. Coming up next is more of our conversation with Megan and Angela Williams from Angela's Voice in just a few moments. Stay tuned. It is therapy, ain't no joke, right here on the Flow Television Network, as well as on Honey. And wherever you get your streaming from, we will be right back after these messages.
I'm Ben Affleck, and I want to thank you for joining me and supporting Paralyzed Veterans of America. I joined the Navy to serve my country as a Navy SEAL. While parachuting with my platoon, my parachute didn't open. I broke my neck. It left me paralyzed. Paralyzed Veterans of America was by my side from that moment on. Since 1946, Paralyzed Veterans of America has kept a promise to our wounded veterans. We will never leave a fallen comrade behind. Thanks to PVA, Paralyzed Veterans are getting specialized medical care and treatments. The benefits they've earned, the jobs they want, and the accessible vehicles and homes they need. I just don't think my family would be as happy as they are without the support that I received from Paralyzed Veterans of America. Our veterans fought for us. Let's fight for them. To learn more, go to pva.org today. Welcome back to Therapy Ain't No Joke. Sean Garvey hanging out with you, ladies and gentlemen. And for all of my Georgians out there and everybody that is currently taking the necessary precautions, uh, please stay safe. Hurricane Storm is in effect for all parts of Georgia and outside of it. We are in hurricane season, so I want to advise everybody to please stay safe and continue to take the necessary precautions to make sure you stay safe. And you're just now joining with us. We are talking to actress Megan in the studio with us this evening on Therapy Ain't No Show. And we, uh, of course, at the beginning of the show, we played an audio clip of Megan detailing um, her mental health journey and she also went more in depth about it you know i was asking her a few questions about her mental health her journey from childhood all the way up to now and we have a few things in common we we all we're in georgia i'm assuming you are still in georgia right i am you are in georgia i'm in georgia as well just came back from florida and um, here, see, it was meant for me to be back here in Georgia. <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. So I'm happy to be back and happy to be uh, on the show talking to you and all things considered mental health because it's a very important conversation that we're having tonight. Uh, joining with us on the show here is the founder and owner of Angela's Voice. And she is uh, joining with us this evening to talk about all things considered mental health and to have a one-on-one -on -one conversation with our very special guest, Megan. So please join me, ladies and gentlemen, in welcoming Angela K. Williams from Angela Voice. Good evening, Angela. How are you? I'm doing great. I'm having some technical difficulties. I'm so sorry I'm not on camera, but oh. I'm definitely <laughs> happy to be with you, Steve and Megan. Um, your story is so similar to so many that have suffered sexual abuse as a child. So I just want to say that my heart goes out to you. And um, and sometimes we just need to stay in bed all day. So don't beat yourself up over that. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Sometimes that's just what we need. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. And before I started this show, both of you all, I wanted to stay in bed all day. And I have a tendency, <laughs> and this is a habit of mine. I, I have a tendency to work a lot. So I am not just only the host of the show, but I'm also the owner of my production company. And us as entrepreneurs, and I know you can, to some extent, Angela, relate, is that us as entrepreneurs, we're nonstop. We're nonstop. We sometimes don't know to put the phone down at times or to shut off the computer or to shut off the laptops and things of that sort. And as a founder of your own organization, of your own company, do you find yourself guilty at times? I hate to use the word guilty, but do you find yourself at times, you know, having to uh, be on the go, on the go all the time, you know, with your phone, with your computer, with your laptop and your other uh, professional needs? Do you find yourself, you know, in, in that 
habit at times. Steve, you don't even know the half of it. I am guilty as charged. <laughs> I'm also a, I also run a real estate company. I'm a real estate broker. So I do my ministry work with survivors of child sexual abuse. I have a podcast called Voice Up for the voiceless uh, and uh, yes, run a nonprofit organization. So I do find it hard to sit down, but part of my healing too is to take care of myself and to love myself. And uh, there's only 24 hours in a day. And mm -hmm. I think it's it's challenging for those of us that suffer with um, anxiety, depression. Um, and we also suffer with rejection. We don't want to reject. We don't want to say no to anybody because we don't want, you know, that rejection. We want to be a people pleaser. Mm. So, yeah, definitely. I find it very difficult to slow down. Um, and on top of that, I am in the process of helping my daughter who has an eight week old. So um, I'm pretty exhausted. <laughs> Uh, yeah, it's fun, but oh my gosh, infants are no joke. <laughs> yeah. 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 Well, I don't know if you both feel this, but I almost feel guilty if I sit down for more than like an hour or 30 minutes. Yeah. Just. I'm like, oh no, I need to get up and do something. Yes. I, <laughs> I, heard a, I heard a long time ago that God called us human beings, not human doings. Oh. And yeah. he expects us to just be, and he tells us at his word to be still and know I'm God. So I think reminding myself that um, I, I don't have to do anything more to please God. He loves me just the way I am. So there's nothing I can do to make him not love me. There's nothing I can do to make him love me more. So I kind of uh, play that in my head a lot. I like that. And yeah. uh, Megan, I'm also a survivor. I was sexually abused from age uh, three to 17 by my stepfather. Oh my so God. I, I can definitely relate to um, that trauma, that childhood trauma and how it manifests into adulthood. And um, it, you can't go through that kind of trauma and not have that a residual effect of anxiety and depression. And um, I'm curious to ask you, when did you break your silence? When did you tell someone? I told someone, uh, so with the help of a therapist, I recently told, let's see, so I'm 28. I told my parents, at the age of 27. Wow. So um, I was a little, uh, they didn't, they were like, oh, okay. They didn't. They Understand how it impacted you in such a traumatic way. How old were you when you were abused? Uh, Three till I was probably uh, 10. 10? It's a long time, Megan. Yes. That's a long time. I know you don't want to disclose your abuser, but was it a family friend or was it a, in the family? It was in the family. Well, that makes it even more challenging and more difficult for, uh, for family to receive. So I'm sure your mother and father... Um, it's easier to uh, pack it away and put it under the rug instead of face it. Yeah, yeah, they didn't obviously want to do anything mm -hmm. to cause drama. So. Yes, yes. So then that turns the t the table on you. That you know, what did I do wrong? I was the victim. Exactly. You know, I didn't ask for this, and here you're going to side with the perpetrator and not stand up for me and not give me justice and not fight for me. Yes. So a lot of that may have may have compounded, I don't know, compounded some of the struggles that you've had um, from depression oh, yeah. and anxiety and oh, yeah. wanting, wanting a response that you didn't get. Um, I, I find that a lot with survivors that I work with. Oh, yeah. Yeah. No, I, I would not doubt if that started my anxiety. Sure. And then now my depression probably comes from my health problems that uh, yeah. i don't know how and are they, you feeling how are you feeling now um oh i i'm doing great you Not look great. great you look healthy 
Thank you. Thank you. I didn't put too much makeup on, but you know. <laughs> oh, you're um, a natural beauty. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Um, but yeah, um, it's just a feeling lonely because sure. nobody really understands what I'm going through. But you know what? I don't know what you're going through. I don't know what Sean's going through. I yeah. Nobody knows. We carry a bag of rocks sure. with us every day. So, you know, we well, just got to be kind to everybody. And kind to ourselves. Yes. I mean, I think as survivors, we tend to carry shame for what happened and we tend to kind of beat ourselves up. It's like, okay, why didn't I tell? Why didn't I scream? Why didn't I, you know, do something? And you're so manipulated as a child that I got to a place in my own mental health journey where I had to look at another three-year-old and say, okay, even like in the grocery store, if I'm past a three-year-old, it'll, it'll just come to my mind. It's like that little precious child had no power exactly to protect herself. She had no power to speak up. She didn't have any any words to even say what was happening to her. So I try to look at myself. No, yeah. she didn't know what it was. So I look at myself and look at a three-year-old child and, and I give myself more grace and try to let that three-year-old heal, the four-year-old heal, the five-year-old heal, the six-year-old heal, the seven-year-old heal, the eight-year-old heal, the nine-year-old heal, and ten. you get my drift because you know yeah. it didn't stop till you were 10 and then you carried the secret. So it still didn't stop. Yeah. And, For a and long time. Our inner child is still inside of us. Yes. We're like Huge. a tree. We're like those rings on a tree. Yeah. So we are every age we've ever been. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So. So we just got to, like you said, give ourselves grace, give and love everybody. Not that who okay not everybody who has been in our shoes but just sure you know well i think we have to um and i wrote a book that got released last september because it oh, was okay. really the last i've written several books um if any of our guests want to check them out it's at angelasvoice.com resources and there's 14 books there um, but this particular one was called Loving Me After Abuse because it was kind of my last frontier is to learn how to love myself because uh, I beat myself up so much for so long and I can't heal without giving myself some, some grace and really understanding that I had no power as a child, but I do have power now to choose, yeah. uh, to choose to be happy, to choose to take care of myself to choose to sit down when I need to sit down, uh, to choose to love, to choose to forgive. So it's got to um, start, I think, with ourselves understanding that uh, trauma takes a toll on us. Yeah. And we absolutely have to um, have to um, do the work that we need to do to take care of ourselves. Yes. And Steve, there's no apostrophe at Angela's voice. It's just angelasvoice.com. For our viewers. Okay, Angela's voice. Okay. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> no apostrophe that confuses it. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we'll make sure we edit that out. Yeah, Angela's no worries. Voice. No worries. Okay. Uh, for those who are just tuning in, Therapy and No Joke with Sean Garvey with my special guest Megan and Angela K. Williams of Angela's Voice. Uh, we're talking about my mental health journey. Um, I, I want to go over to you, Angela, and I want to come in and uh, ask you this regarding sexual abuse and child yes. abuse and yeah. how rare is it you know even nowadays in 2024 yeah uh, is it becoming more of a common often thing for children to find themselves in that predicament and in that circumstance when it comes to childhood by how rare mm -hmm. is it nowadays so so a, a good average is about one in ten children uh cbc statistics kind of change um but their latest statistic was one in four girls and one in 16 boys boys don't disclose as much as girls do so i think that statistic is a lot higher only one in ten will ever tell the average age of disclosure is 53 years old. So if you do the math, then we are way off on those statistics. 
in my mind, in the people that I meet, I would say about 50% of children have some form of sexual abuse, whether it's exposure to pornography, whether it's peer on peer abuse, whether it's family, friends, 93% of the time it's someone the child knows, loves and trusts. So guess what? It's someone that their parents know, love and trust, which seals the secret even more because the child begins to try to protect the perpetrator um, and they're manipulated. You know, this is our little secret. We're not going to tell anybody. And as a child, you want to please an adult. Um, with my stepfather, he threatened to kill my mother if I ever told. And if I ever was not submissive, he would severely abuse her in front of me and say, see what you caused, see what you're doing. So um, pedophiles, abusers of children, they are, um, they're, they're devious, they're evil, and um, they need help. <laughs> they need help. But you look at even pornography, um, the leading production of pornography includes children and uh, even children involved in bestiality, which is a whole nother level. Um, there's a huge appetite for child pornography that has increased, um, I would say over the last 10 years exponentially. It's a $97 billion industry, 97, wrap your head around that. 97 billion, 93% of it is produced in the US. Mm -hmm. so I could bore you all night with statistics. No, this, mm -hmm. Um, but it is a serious problem. And yes, it's getting worse because our children are so sexualized in every everywhere they turn. Mm. Megan, do you have kids of your own or no? I don't. No, no. no. So you can it, it, I mean, imagine if you had kids and you was a parent and, you know, your kids are in this world where they are now exposed to everything from billboard signs television you name it even other people and, and how cautious of a parent could you imagine how cautious you would be if you had kids and you know it's crazy i mean i have a lot of friends these days that are just saying i don't even know if i want to have kids and bring them into this world because of how how i mean just the world the environment the everything right now is just i don't know if i want to bring a, a being into this world wow uh, angela okay well the greater the evil the greater our god is so we have to trust that good will prevail over evil and uh, there's a verse in scripture, all things work together for good for those who love the Lord and called according to his purpose. So I stand on that and I stand and use the pain that I've gone through for purpose to try to help others. Right. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's a wild world right now, <laughs> but yeah, yeah, it's, it's a scary, scary thing. Yeah, I, even when I hear someone, and it's not just only you, Megan, but I've also heard people that at one point in time wanted to be parents, wanted to bring kids into the world, and now they don't because of where the world is at and, and just the number. I mean, even Angela broke it down, the statistics nowadays, and they are just skeptical of having kids being born into the world and being exposed to every and all things and every and all people it's kind of somewhat daunting if i could use that adjective word uh, it's, it's scary to have that mindset you really want to be a parent you want to bring a new life into the world but you also have that uncertainty of your child being born into the world and they might or he or she might go through the same scenario, the same situation that you went through as a kid, you know, and you, you want to protect, you want to be able to be a protective parent and protect your children and protect your kids. So that way they won't face the same fate that you want to face. Well, unfortunately, we're in a society where parents are oblivious and think it's not going to happen to my child. 
So what we do at Angela's Voice is try to equip parents and provide resources. Um, so there's a book also called Tough Talk to Tender Hearts, which helps parents layer conversations throughout a child's life of what do you say to a child to equip them, prepare them, help them face the risk of sexual abuse, know what how to scream no, know that no one's supposed to touch them with their bathing suit covers, know the anatomical names of their body parts. So there are things that parents can do to be vigilant and to help children face the risk of sexual abuse and not be um, not be susceptible to abuse. So that's part of my mission is to say, not on my watch, will a child be sexually abused? Um, but there's a lot stacked against children. It's um, it, it's it's not only the abuse, but the, our court system too, um, unless there's a, just an ironclad case, so few cases actually get prosecuted. So pedophiles rarely ever, ever come to justice. So it's, it's very convoluted. It's a, it's a big problem that uh, we just have to eat it like an elephant one bite at a time. Mm -hmm. Angela Williams of Angela's Voice, along with Megan, we at the top of the hour. This is Therapy Ain't No Joke with Sean Garvey. If you are just tuning in to the program, the showrunner, my mental health journey with Megan and Angela Williams of Angela's Voice. We're talking about all things considered mental health and uh, Megan's journey to uh, recovery. And just the fact that she is here with us speaks volume. Um, we, we, and I say that with full honesty, Megan, because uh, there are people, unfortunately, that are not here with us today to even share their story with us um, from an unfortunate standpoint. And I want to switch, yeah, I, I, I mean, you're more than welcome to comment on that uh, before we, we visit a, a part of uh, a show that we did last week. We're going to get into that in just a few moments. But just by me saying that, um, Megan, there were, were there times where you thought about doing the opposite, doing the unthinkable from all the things that you went through in your life just by being very candid in the audio recording that we played earlier in the broadcast. Uh, talk to us, were there times where it was just so dark, you, you, you was just about to throw in the towel or thought about throwing in the towel? Yeah, yeah. There has been a few times. And I mean, there were times where I was just on the ground crying, being like, I, I mean, what else am I going to do with my life? I mean, this is a progressive disorder. <laughs> the doctor said I have five years with my life. Though this doctor knew nothing about my disorder. Um, and I mean, this doctor, six months later passed away mm. now i um went and found a specialist and he said that i am like a, a beacon of light because a lot of people at my age first of all don't even make it to my age Second of all, um, I should be in a wheelchair or with a walker or something like that. Um, there is no known cure, but um, we, my family and I, are um, doing like going to conferences and I am an ambassador. So um, I am a mentor to kids, teens, young adults who don't really have a voice. Some of them are um, nonverbal. And I, being an ambassador, anybody who is newly diagnosed comes to me and I help the families and I am 
very happy that I can be the one to help those in need. And I, I want to be, you know, early, earlier, I, I was willing to just throw in the towel. I didn't, I wasn't wanting to be there for myself. Hmm. I, I wasn't, you know, I was put on this earth to take care of a human being myself and I didn't want to do that. And now I feel like I have a purpose mm. and that's to help those without any, like any voice. And I, I think I'm here to help people. Um, now, my doctor says I'm not progressing anymore. So that's amazing. Um, I believe in miracles. That's a miracle. <laughs> yeah. So I, I am here living by myself. I shouldn't even be able to do that. Um, and I'm acting, I'm happy. And I mean, you know, not every day. Um, but yeah, yeah, it's, mm. I'm living life. Well, it sounds I, like your work and your ministry is bringing you more healing. Yes. And I say, don't let anybody speak a death sentence over you. So we just find that. And we all are going to live till we die. I could walk mm -hmm. out and get hit by a car tomorrow. None of us know. Exactly. We just have to live till we die. Yep. Yeah. 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 So that is, that's the, that's my story right now. Is, you have hope. I think, I think people go to a place of, of suicide when they lose all hope. Um, I myself uh, tried to commit suicide several times and um, very seriously, like had the plan, executed the plan. I took 64 sleeping pills and uh, drank a half a bottle of vodka straight and, um, uh, very well could could have by the great there go me by the grace of god that he saved my life um, yeah. so I, I know that hopelessness and i just feel like you feel like you have no choice and the world would just be better off without you you convince yourself of that you tell yourself i say the big lie um, and it is such a lie because yeah. our, our lives are precious yeah yeah i just felt like such a burden like mm -hmm. for a while yeah but I no longer feel that. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. I, I want to ask Angela this, um, listeners and viewers that are tuning in. I I did a show on WLK called The Mental Space, of course. And um, once upon a time, I had a gentleman on that called into the radio program and he had thoughts about taking his own life. He had suicidal thoughts because mm -hmm. his company wasn't going the way he wanted to go. He got, you know, put into positions where he came across a lot of fraudulent activity or fraudulent people. He was losing a lot of money and he one day was broke, one day was poor, and he thought about taking his own life. And so, for you, um, you know, Angela, as people, we, we do the work. We are out here doing mm -hmm. the work. We are out here having these platforms and we having these conversations. But when you're having a conversation with that person who are having those suicidal thoughts, like mm -hmm. from your expert, from your expertise, what do we have to take into consideration when we are engaging in conversations or talking to people that have those thoughts? What do we need to be mindful of? Well, Sean, I think if uh, people are having thoughts and that they need to get help immediately. So I think encouraging them to to reach out and to tell people around them that that love them and support them and encourage them to be honest, to say, I am struggling to the point of wanting to take my life. So to encourage them that someone needs them, loves them, supports them and their life is more than money. Their life is more than success their life has value 
and so to help them know that there's hope and uh, I have a strong faith um, in Jesus Christ and that's what brought me back from the depths of darkness and to encourage them that God loves them and God created them for purpose and you know what when he closes one door he opens another one so just because this door is closing and you've lost all your money well guess what Tomorrow is a new day. The sun is going to rise and there'll be new opportunity with that day. So just encouragement for anyone that's listening. Um, I just want to encourage you to to uh, to seek help, to tell somebody to open your mouth and say, I am struggling. And I think people in our society um, and, and it may be just perceived, but there's such weakness in seeking mental health there's such weakness they they perceived that you you seem weak if you need to go to therapy or go to counseling or if that you're struggling mentally where if you are struggling physically or you have a physical ailment or you're struggling with cancer or you're struggling with something you can tell somebody and get the support but for some reason there's this big wall when it comes to our mental health so i just want to encourage people Find, call a friend, call a, a family member just to say, I am struggling and I need help. Um, and I hope hope a friend will get in the car and come immediately and say, you're not doing this alone. You're not alone in this. You have somebody that loves you. Yeah. Yeah. And it goes back to the support system that I was mm-hmm. talking about. Uh, exactly. And, and having that support system. By the way, ladies and gentlemen, uh, if you're watching, you tuning in at the bottom of the screen there, you see the 988 number listed below the screen. You can dial the crisis and suicide lifeline 988 if you or someone you know is facing a mental health crisis. That's 988, the opposite from 911. But dial 988 operators are standing by to take your phone calls. Uh, for those who are just tuning in, we are talking to Megan. And Angela K. Williams, founder of Angela's Voice on Therapy Ain't No Joke every Wednesday night from 7 to 9 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, wherever you get your podcasts and streaming from the Flow Television Network. And honey, I want to switch gears for one moment, Megan and Angela. Uh, two things I want to go over or, or cover with you all on um, tonight's broadcast. Going back to Megan um, in the audio recording, and she spoke about this just a few moments ago about being in the space where she is just focusing on herself, her mental health journey, and not trying to date, not going out on any dates, not doing anything pertaining to dating right now, you know, but just focusing on your mental health journey. And and so I want to revisit the episode that I did with Shanta Hayes, by the way, you can check it out on demand on Spotify and iHeartRadio. Uh, we did a show, Angela, about unhealed dating. Why? Yeah, I watched you- it. I watched the show today. <laughs> yeah, well, well, let's let's talk about it. What are your thoughts on the episode and the conversation that we had on that topic? Well, I think you bring unhealed trauma into every relationship. So that's why it's so critical and especially an intimate relationship where you're seeking a soulmate or seeking someone to spend the rest of your life with. And if you've got your bag of rocks, as Megan said, you got your big old bag of trash that you're dragging around with you, you filter that trauma through every conversation. And so, and I am very blessed. I've been married for 40 years. I'm a lot older than you guys. I'm 60 years old. So I've been married since I was 20, so 40 years, and I married my soulmate, and he's precious, and we have an amazing, passionate, loving relationship. Oh, wow. But he healed with me. He helped me heal. So I say we kind of grew up together, and we did our healing together. He came from a lot of trauma, too. But I think that people have to recognize until they are healed and and okay with themselves and love themselves, um, it's hard to come into a relationship because no one is going to complete you. Um, and you can't change somebody else to make them what you want them to be. So, um, yeah, I did listen to it. I thought it was a really great show. And I do think that the dating apps has taken away a lot of the really intimate moments of meeting and letting a spark happen organically. Mm-hmm. I think we're forcing relationships by the swipe left, swipe right. And we're evaluating mm-hmm. people on their looks, their weight, their job. 
versus the chemistry that is just it just had this reaction that happens between two people um, my husband and i i mean i literally saw fireworks over his head like i was fell madly in love with him probably within the first 30 minutes of our date and just was giddy and trying not to let him know this trying to play it cool like okay <laughs> Uh, trying to let there be a little bit of a chase in it, <laughs> but um, mm -hmm. I, I'm really kind of disappointed in what what the dating world has become mm -hmm. because I think we've lost that that spark that happens across the room, uh, you know, in the romance um, that creates that's there naturally, the chemistry that there is there naturally. Well, I, I want to stay on that. Let's stay on that, Angela. You established that you 40 years, you and your husband, 40 years in. Did I hear that correctly? 40 years next year. Yes. 40 years. Okay. 40 years yeah. next year. We were married in 1985. So we celebrate our 40 year, uh, 2025. So wow. we're almost there. See, that, and I said this, ladies and gentlemen, I want to be clear. I've said this, I do not want to get dating and or relationship advice from nobody unless they're close to 40 years in. <laughs> I'm, or, or, or I'm there. Years. I'm your girl. I'm there. <laughs> <laughs> I, I want to be, because I want to go back to something that you said. He came in, he had trauma and, and you had, you know, your past mm -hmm. and what have you. But we would think on the outside looking in angela we would think that it would be something where two people come in to the relationship unhealed or they had some type of baggage or some type of past or what have you it would not make it it, it would not materialize at yeah. all so how how did you two made it work though how did you make it work um, so I write about this in um, another one of my books. It's called From Sorrows to Sapphires. And I really di dive deep into our relationship because for so long I pushed him away. I really felt like he needed a girl who um, had not gone through so much trauma, that he needed a girl who was healed, that he needed, you know, a uh, little Miss Sunshine. And here I am. Um, I've been on my own since I was 17. I ran away from home. I worked three jobs. I was trying to send myself through college. I really didn't have time for a relationship. So I really pushed him away. And we became really close friends. And I was trying to set him up with other girls. Um, so for wow. months, yeah. So for months, we were just buddies. And I said, I'm not going to date you. I don't want a relationship. Now, mind you, I had gone out with him. He had he had done me a huge favor and I had just taken him out to dinner as friends, but mm. literally inside I was, my stomach was doing flips and knew that I, oh, I loved this man, but I loved him so much. I wanted him to have a good, healthy, happy relationship. And I didn't think I could do that. So the harder I ran, the, the harder he chased. Um, and so when he finally told me he loved me, I tried to cut the relationship off. I'm like, no, nope, you can't love me. Not that's off limits. You have to just leave. Like we can't even be friends anymore. We, we're not crossing this, this boundary. So, um, it, he just persisted. He just persisted. And I finally gave up and I said, okay, we'll give it one shot. And if it doesn't work in dating, then we're going to walk away and we're going to be friends and we're going to call it a day. And mm. so um we just had a love i think you know i think he's my soulmate and i think we i do believe that everyone does have a soulmate and i think i was so fortunate to meet him so young and he we both fought for our marriage we didn't give up we always said we're not getting out of the car this marriage this marriage is our car nobody's opening the door and getting out we're gonna duke it out inside this car and we're gonna make it work and we fought really hard. There were hard times. There were hard days. There were, I went through a lot of PTSD. I went through a lot of nightmares. I went through a lot of, um, you can't touch me like that. You can't breathe on my neck like that. You can't, you know, just from everything my stepfather had done to really pervert sex and intimacy. Um, he really, I gave him a run for his money. And then his mother was an alcoholic. So he had mother issues. Um, and we just kept fighting through the healing. We just kept trying to heal together. And we, um, I wouldn't say at the beginning of our marriage, but I would say probably 10 years in, we decided to put God first in our marriage and we decided to grow in our faith together. And we pray together every morning. We have devotional time every morning. And that was really a turning point, I think, in our healing process. But, uh, yeah, I, I, 
it's a miracle, but um, we did heal together, but we knew we needed to heal. I think a lot of people mask, they, they put their pain in a Pandora's box and they close yeah. the lid and they think it's going to go away. Where we did the opposite. We did the hard work together to know that, okay, we want a happy family. We want good, stable children. And we didn't do it perfectly. We weren't perfect parents, but my daughter is an OBGYN. Um, a very successful doctor, and my son is a police officer. So they're both on the front lines. They're both great human beings, and they have great marriages themselves. So I, I like to think we did something right. Wow. I, I'm listening to this, and I'm, <laughs> my mind is blown because today in the dating world and the dating apps and the dating mm -hmm. climate with people that have so much going on and so much that they're holding on to going into a platform and meeting new people it's like oh um, i haven't seen so many people giving up it's it's crazy to me it's insane to me and you know i i find myself in so many occasions where i would be in the friend zone a lot like mm -hmm. you know can we be friends or i'm just not there yet and yeah. that sort of thing and i was like okay is that does that friend zone mean that i need to start chasing you or is it like okay you just you give it up on something that could be a blessing to both of us down the road you know. Well, I think you has to start with a friendship. I mean, my husband is my best friend. So I think if you start with a friendship and see what happens organically, mm -hmm. see if you have butterflies, see if you miss them, see if you want to call them, see if you can't, like we can't hardly breathe without each other. Like we love being together so much and we have so much fun together. So I think, I think it has to start with a friendship. But I think the whole dating um, app situation has a lot of expectations, you know, yeah. that, it, that it has to happen immediately or you move on to the next one. You know, right. it's like if it doesn't happen the first three dates, well, I'm out of here. So if there is something there and you know it, you know, when you're attracted to somebody, I mean, come on, mm -hmm. you know, when you got that spark, yeah, that little yeah. feeling in the, in the pit of your stomach. Um, so that's the beginning of it. And then see what happens naturally. Give it some time. Nobody, nobody has any patience anymore. Oh, man. Ooh. <laughs> yeah, this is welcome to the microwavable society of dating right now. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, Sean, my yeah. advice would be to have no expectations. Don't put expectations on people because they're going to let you down. Mm. They are always going to let you down. So take yeah. expectations off the table. Let's just go have fun. Let's go hike a mountain. Let's go jump out of an airplane. Let's go have some fun together and see how you interact, you know? Yeah, yeah. Megan, I'm looking at you and I know your mind must be blown away just as mine <laughs> is. So, but your situation, especially in the dating world, at least in recently, is a bit different and even at times very bittersweet and tragic at, at times from what you illustrated but you know kind of let us know like what what is it that really made you say hey you know and i'm just going to take a break from dating for a while to focus on my mental health journey like what is it that you don't want to happen if you were to put yourself in a place where you're back out there in the dating market well I have, I'm definitely um, a, an empath. I'm very much like, <laughs> I don't know why, but I, I, I'm like, I have like a sonar where I'm like, oh my gosh, this person is broken. I need to <laughs> like go help them. <laughs> um, and I have learned boundaries, 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 boundaries. So, um, I, I found the red flags and I don't want any more red flags. Um, I don't want any more toxic masculinity. I don't want, I, I don't want somebody that is going to treat me badly. 
um, like they have in the past. So I, because it's just like, I, I want someone who just would naturally, it, it would just come organically, like naturally. So right now I am just focusing on myself. I am loving myself because it's cliche, but if I can't love myself, I really, truly cannot love someone else fully. So. Okay, that's fair, that's fair enough. Let's put a bookmark there because I want to go over back over to Angela and to you, Megan, because I hear that word a lot in conversations as it ties in with mental health. Toxic masculinity. Yeah, I hear that so much. What What do you define, Angela? What do you define as toxic masculinity? Uh, power. I, I think men want power over women. Um, and my husband puts me on a pedestal and just worships the ground I walk on. And I think my stepfather, who was abusive, very abusive to my mother, very abusive, of course, to me, and not just sexually. I had emotional abuse, had physical abuse. So I think the toxic masculinity is someone that wants power. And I think that comes with narcissism. I think they have a narcissistic personality where it's all about me, 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 um, versus putting the woman in their life uh, before them, willing to lay down their lives. My husband would, look, he would take a bullet for me. I have no question. He would lay down his life for me in a New York second. And I think men who um, are into themselves and are selfish, and um, are abusive. And I always tell, um, yeah, I mentor a lot of women and I tell them, I said, if they show you the true colors, run. Don't think it was a one off. Don't think that, oh, he was having a bad day. If you see the true colors, you run the other direction because you don't need that in your life. Mm -hmm. So I would say toxic masculinity is, is men that want power and control over women. And they do it manipulatively. They do it um, abusively. Um, and they do it selfishly. Um, and that's how that's, I don't know if there's a, if that's the real definition, but that's my definition. Mm -hmm. And then those were some of the things that you witnessed that you experienced, Megan, in your day in life from what you illustrated previously, right? And I also think that men have been raised. Um, I'm so sorry, Megan. Hold on, oh, no. put a pin in there. I think men have been raised with a steady appetite of pornography, and that's where they're learning how to treat women. And 99% of pornography comes with violence in sex and intimacy. So I think that that's part of our problem. It's a societal problem um, that young boys are being introduced to pornography and sex through pornography and trained versus a mother and a father teaching them what a loving, kind, giving relationship is and what needs to happen in a sexual intimate relationship. Um, and it is not what is portrayed in porn. Mm -hmm. a, a combination of so many things that can contribute to toxic masculinity. Uh, yes. But to, to you, Megan, because uh, you, you really explained it earlier about being in an abusive relationship, not just with just one guy, but with m multiple guys, right? Right. Yeah. 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 So, so the. I guess toxicness, we're going to make that a word. Um, so the things I experienced were, um, I experienced love bombing, mm -hmm. which I guess if nobody has heard of that. I have. I have. Okay. It's a narcissistic trait too. It's number the yeah. one number one narcissistic trait is love bombing. Yes, and I experienced that a lot. Um, I also experienced a lot of gaslighting, mm -hmm. um, and I'm like, oh my gosh, am I crazy, or did this happen, or did this not happen? Um, so that happened. Um, then actually physical abuse um happened 
um, when I was getting intimate, um, he, like this guy would actually hit me with a belt multiple Oof. times and like i would just have like marks all over my body um and you didn't call 911 megan come on girl <laughs> um oh i don't even know if i should say this this guy um told me he was in a gang later in the relationship and then i did not know how to leave the relationship oh goodness so, wow that that's another story <laughs> um yeah so he was scary um uh yeah just people being like you're taking advantage of my my like walking over me and my nice niceness i was just gonna niceness. say that you're kind because that's the energy that we we getting from you you're very nice you're very kind yeah you're vulnerable your vulnerability vulnerable. yeah yeah which is a great trait, you know. Uh, a lot of survivors put up walls and, and become get really tough elephant skin. They won't let anybody in. Yeah. So being vulnerable is part of your healing. I'm sure you had to get to a place of vulnerability. Yeah. Um, I know I did. I had a lot of walls built, a lot of walls. And I've been in abusive relationships. I um, before I met my husband was in a horrible relationship or I was being so taken advantage of and abused. And I just, you know, just I remember just kind of falling to my knees on a gravel um, road in front of his house and thinking, God, what did I do to deserve this? I don't want this. This is not I, I, I've just gotten out of 14 years of abuse. And here I'm right back where I started from in another abusive relationship. And I was like, okay. I'd rather be by myself than, than have this. Um, and just cried out. I was like, I just, I, I don't, if I can't have a good man, I don't want any man at all. I don't think I've to this day have had a totally healthy relationship. So it's just like, I would prefer to be single than just not We're going to pray for that. I'm just going to pray over you. I'm going to pray oh, for a good, healthy relationship because you deserve it. You've been through so much. You've been through so much. It's made me stronger. It yes. has. I can tell you're one tough cookie. I am. <laughs> Maybe it's the Irish. And... <laughs> I just want to say Pretty this. Red hair. Yeah. <laughs> I just want to say this. FYI, I do a show called Soul Dates Live outside of Therapy ain't no joke. We had a woman that kind that came on the show last week, and a uh, different situation. But she's been on the dating apps, and she comes across a lot of toxic masculinity mm -hmm. type of people. So we're trying to get her on the show, not on this show, but on So Dates Live. So maybe there's a little bit of hope for you, Megan. We, we we'll okay. talk offline. <laughs> we'll talk offline, but. but but any any advice, Angela, before we go to our last topic, any advice you want to give to uh, women like Megan that are in that vulnerable state and that are still going through their mental health journey after so many failed relationships? Any advice? Yeah. advice? Well, I love what your guest had said in your last show to really seek out um, encounters with men that maybe you have a reference. You know, maybe you, it's a friend of a friend that you know something about them. You know some history. Um, it's just not kind of a cold call or blind date, um, which is what you get on the dating apps. And I would also say when they show you their true colors, the first second you run, you, you go the opposite direction. You know, this relationship is over. You block them, you, you move on because those true colors, they make and fake it for a while, but time always tells. Um, and value yourself, value yourself enough to not accept uh, any type of abuse, be it physical, emotional, sexual just value yourself you deserve more than that indeed like indeed that. indeed indeed 
All right. Uh, for those who are just tuning in uh, to the uh, last part of Therapy Ain't No Joke from 7 p.m. to 9 p.m. every Wednesday night on Honey and on the Flow Television Network and on YouTube, wherever you get your streaming content from. We're talking about my mental health journey with our special guests, Megan and Angela K. Williams, of founder of Angela's Voice. And our last part of the conversation as it ties in with mental health, of course, we are 21 days, about 21 days in from the tragic event that took place in a uh, local school here in Georgia, the uh, mass shooting that took place in Winder, Georgia. And I want to get your take on it, uh, Angela, as well as Megan, as we are talking about my mental health journey, as we are all three, I'm assuming you, Angela, you are in the state of Georgia as yes. we um, As Georgians, as people that are currently residents of Georgia, how close did it hit home to you from the tragic shooting that took place in that local school in Wyanda, Georgia? Let's start with you, Megan. Did it hit close to home to you? It did. Um, so I'm a native to Florida, Orlando, Florida. And I don't know if you've heard of the Pulse shootings. Mm -hmm. oh, yeah. Um, oh, yeah. Yeah. But my friends were supposed to go to Pulse that night. And I didn't know they ended up going to a club down the street. So I thought they were at Pulse. And um, then when I woke up the next morning, I was, I heard about Pulse and I was freaking out. I and of course they're sleeping in because they went to a club. And I was freaking out. I I was sobbing. I was like, oh my God, my friends, I don't know if any of them got shot. Um and you know the there's a lot of shootings in Florida, but this one was the worst. And just hearing about these poor children that have to like they now have like evacuation protocols for shootings I, I i can't even imagine i i never had that growing up and just i i yeah i it hit home it really hit home and those poor babies I, I, my heart goes out to them and their families. So, yeah, I, I hope they're, I hope, I hope they're healing and I just, like, you hear about shootings in schools, like, daily now. And it's, it's almost numbing. Like, it's almost like, oh, there's been another shooting. And it's wild to me. So, I don't know. Yeah. Angela, you're, yeah, Angela, yeah. you Well, I think it speaks to our, I'm going to say societal, because I think it's worldwide, our societal mental health crisis. And it is a mental health crisis. This child obviously is troubled, obviously needed help, obviously was on someone's radar, obviously had parents that need help. I think they are obviously to buy your child a, a gun, a, that that powerful gun. Uh, and, and I do hope they're held accountable. But I, I think there again, everybody was a silent bystander in this child's life that kind of looked the other way. And why was there not intervention that would have saved these lives? So it, it's devastating. It's, it's, I can't, I can't even wrap my head around the number of shootings, the number of deaths, you know, going all the way back to Sandy Hook. So I, I think there's a, I think there's a deep, a deep problem with people not helping someone that they see as suffering. What is wrong with us? Mm -hmm. yeah. 
Oh, teachers sorry. had interaction. No, teachers had interactions with this child. They knew he was troubled. Family members had to have interaction with this child. They knew he was troubled. Why? His family was troubled. Why can't people step in and help? Yeah, Megan, were you about to say something? I was just going to say that the amount of, I mean, the child was troubled yes but the amount of bullying cyber bullying especially with the technology like i mean when i was growing up we just had like slide phones but like now it i can't even imagine how much like the kids are looking at like Oh, the beauty standards of today, and uh, it's, I, I don't know, I, it's, it's, there's just so much bullying, and yeah. I hope they're okay. I, I didn't get a chance to really um, say much on the shooting in the first episode of Therapy Ain't No Joke, uh, because when we did the episode, we did it uh one week from the incident that happened and it's so funny that you brought up florida megan because when i heard about the story that broke on the news about the mass shooting that took place in that high school i was in florida and before i traveled to florida i had this mindset of if i'm going to come back to georgia alive because I've heard so many tragic events in Florida. And of course, from a reality standpoint, there's going to be some sort of crime and violence everywhere you go to. But certain things in Florida reminded me of what could potentially happen to me down there in Florida. But I was fortunate enough to come back home to Georgia and be with my friends and my family and my support system, right? But when I heard that uh, incident for the first time, like the day before, like maybe a day or two before I traveled back to Georgia, I, I said to myself, I questioned in my 